because of the so-called big data revolution. The view according to which theory is dead at the ends of big data analysis. But has the big data revolution really made theory building obsolete? The best known formulation of the big data revolution is by Anderson. Anderson states that faced with massive data the old approach to science, hypothesized model test, is becoming obsolete. We are at the end of theory because the data deluge makes the scientific method obsolete. The new availability of huge amounts of data, along with the statistical tools to crunch these numbers, offers a whole new way of understanding the world. We can analyze the data without hypothesis about what it might show. We can throw the numbers into the biggest computing clusters the world has ever seen and let statistical algorithms find patterns where science cannot. This is Google founding philosophy and it is time to ask what can science learn from Google? This is what Anderson writes. Supporters of the big data revolution often portray Bacon as a precursor. For instance, Siegfried writes that Bacon proclaimed that science could discover truths about nature only by empirical testing all possible explanations for all the observed phenomena. For example, science could discover the natural heat only by recording all observed facts about all manner of heat-related phenomena, and then performing experiments to eliminate incorrect explanations. So, according to uh, Siegfried, Bacon was a fan of big data. With today's massive computerized collections of massive amounts of data on everything, at last, Bacon's dream has been realized these claims, however, to my opinion, are unjustified. Bacon was not a fan of big data. According to Bacon, I quote, experience when it wanders in its own track, unguided by theory, is mere groping in the dark. Without theory, human beings wander astray with no settled course, but totally take counsel from things as they fall out and so make little progress. So, human beings must not only seek and procure abundance of experiments, but must also develop theories for carrying on and advancing experience. This is Bacon. As implicit in Bacon, the view that the data deluge made theory building obsolete is illusory. The assumption that data are completely independent of theories is favored by the fact that the term data comes from the Latin dare, which means to give. This suggests that data are raw elements that are given by the phenomena. But this is not so, because observation is always selective. Every choice of the data is a reflection of an often stated set of assumptions and hypotheses about what we want and expect from the data. Therefore, data are not simple elements that are abstracted from the world in neutral and objective ways, there is always a viewpoint preceding observation and experiment that is a theory or hypothesis which guides observation and experiment and generally data finding. Data don't speak for themselves but acquire meaning only when they are interpreted and interpreting them requires a theory through which to observe them and extract information from them. 
In particular, systems of data analysis are designed to capture certain kinds of data, and the algorithms used to that purpose are based on some theory and then they refined it through testing. Thus, a statistical strategy of identifying patterns within data is based on previous findings and theories. Then, it is illusory to think that statistical strategies <coughs> may automatically discover insights without presupposing any theory or testing. This is admitted even by some supporters of big data revolution, for instance, Berman in his book writes that for big data projects, holding a prior theory or model is almost always necessary. Otherwise, the scientist is overwhelmed by the options. It is somehow ironical that at the same time as the big data revolution was proclaimed, the financial crisis of 2007-2008 occurred. Financial analysts who had thrown the numbers into the biggest computing clusters the world had ever seen and had let statistical algorithms find patterns failed to foresee the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression of the 30s. While not invalidating the big data revolution, this raises some serious doubts about it. However, although the big data revolution has not made theory building obsolete, today theory building is a not well developed subject in its own right. This is due to the fact that a crucial part of theory building is the process of discovery, and most scientists and philosophers think that there is no rational approach to discovery. To them, discovery appears as a mysterious process that somehow happens and happens through intuition. Just to quote to famous cases, Einstein writes, there is no logical path to the basic laws of physics, only intuition resting on sympathetic understanding of experience can reach them. And Popper writes, there is no such thing as a logical method of having new ideas or a logical reconstruction of this process. Every discovery contains an irrational element or a creative intuition in their own sense. The lack of a or rational approach to the process of discovery and hence to theory building characterizes two main views of scientific theories, the syntactic or hypothetical deductive view and the semantic or model theoretic view. Neither of these views provides a rational account of theory building. The syntactic view of theories, for instance, are stated by Hempel. According to Hempel, a theory consists of an uninterpreted deductive system, usually thought of as an axiomatized calculus, whose postulates correspond to the basic principles of the theory, and a set of statements that assign empirical meaning to the terms and the sentences of the calculus by linking them to potential observational or experimental findings. Theories, Impel continues, cannot be obtained by any process of systematic inference. They are not derived from observed facts but are invented in order to account for them. They are invented by an exercise of creative imagination. Their discovery requires inventive ingenuity. It calls for imaginative, insightful guessing. That is, it calls for intuition. Thus, according to the syntactic view, theories cannot be obtained by any process of systematic inference. They are the result of an act of intuition. The syntactic view has been very widespread. In particular, both Einstein and Popper supported it. For instance, Einstein writes, the intuitive grasp of the essentials of a large complex of facts leads the scientist to a basic law. Then, from the basic law, that is, system of axioms, the scientist derives his conclusion as completely as possible in a purely logical deductive manner. The conclusions deduced from the basic law are then compared to experience. In this manner, they provide criteria for the justification of the assumed basic law. Basic law, that is, axioms and conclusion together form what is called theory. Popper similarly states, 
from a basic law obtained through creative intuition, conclusions are drawn by means of logical deduction and compared with experience. So the basic law is tested by way of empirical applications of the conclusion which can be derived from it. This is the scientific method, which is then the method of deductive testing. However, the syntactic view is inadequate. By the first incompetence theorem, for any consistent, sufficiently strong formal system, there is a sentence of the system which is true, but cannot be deduced from the axiom of the system. Thus, there will be laws of the theory which cannot be deduced from the postulates of the theory. Moreover, the syntactic view is unable to provide a rational account of theory building, saying that theories are invented by an exercise of creative imagination is an irrational explanation. Furthermore, the syntactic view is an, unable to account for theory change, the process by which one theory comes to be replaced by another one. For, according to the syntactic view, a theory has no, has no rational connection with the preceding one, except that it agrees with more observational and experimental data than the preceding one. The semantic view of theories, as stated by von Frassen, a theory is identified with its class of models. To present a theory is to specify a family of structures, its models. Such family of structures is specified directly without paying any attention to questions of axiomatizability in any special language. A model is a mathematical structure. More precisely, a model is a structure plus a function that interprets the sentences in that structure. If a theory is advocated from Frass and Gonzon, then the claim is made that these models can be used to represent the phenomena and to represent them accurately. Here we say that the model can be used to represent a given phenomenon accurately only if it has a substructure isomorphic to that phenomenon. Theories cannot be obtained by any process of systematic inference. In fact, from Frassen states, all those successes of science which so many people have thought has been produced by induction or abduction were initially just good guesses under fortunate circumstances. Afterwards, they were made effective by means of the precise formulation of their implication to logic and mathematics. If our process of knowledge is to be successful, on facts and states, we must be lucky we have no way to constrain such fortune. The semantic view became very popular a few decades ago. Nevertheless, it is inadequate. A model is a structure and hence a mathematical object, while a phenomenon is not a mathematical object. Von Frassel himself states, if the target, namely the phenomenon, is not a mathematical <coughs> object, then we don't have a well-defined range for the function. So, Frassen asks, how can we speak of an embedding or isomorphism or homomorphism or whatever between that target and some mathematical logic? The first answer is that we compare the model not with the phenomenon but rather with the data model that is our representation of the phenomenon. Now, the data model, from Frassen states, is itself a mathematical structure. So, there is indeed a matching of structures involved, and is a matching of two mathematical structures, namely the theoretical model and the data model. This answer, however, is inadequate because the data model is a mathematical object, while the phenomenon is not a mathematical object. This raises the question of the matching of the data model and the phenomenon. So, von Frassen's sensor does not solve the problem but simply pushes the problem back one step. Moreover, even a fiction can have a model in the sense of a mathematical structure. Therefore, it's not models that can make a distinction between fictions and reality. In addition, the semantic view is unable to provide an account of theory building. Saying that theories are good guesses under fortunate circumstances is a non-explanation. It completes the basic issue. Furthermore, 
The semantic view entails that scientific theories, being families of structure, are stating things, static things. But scientific theories undergo development. The semantic view has no alternative than treating their development as a progression of successive families or models. Then the issue arises how the transition from a, a theory to the next one in the progression comes about. The semantic view has nothing to say about this because it does not account for the process of theory building, which is essential to explain the development of theories and theory change. Therefore, it cannot account for the dynamic character of scientific theories. It is somewhat ironical that while contemporary views of scientific theories are as the syntactic and semantic one, are unable to give accounts of theory building. Whereas the two philosophical giants of antiquity, Plato and Aristotle, gave such accounts. This is not a place to describe their accounts, of course, but it seems right to me and proper to mention them. In particular, it seems to me right and proper to mention Plato's account. Because an account of theory building, the analytic view of theories, can be given by mod slightly modifying Plato's original account. According to the analytic view of theories, a theory is an open set of problems about the world and hypotheses that permit solve them. An open set because the hypotheses are not given once for all, but new hypotheses can always be introduced or the existing one can always be modified. Theory building consists in starting from problems, introducing hypotheses and inducing solutions to problems from them, where hypotheses are introduced through non-deductive rules, such as induction, analogy, metaphor, and so on. Hypotheses must be plausible. Not true, plausible. That is, the arguments for hypothesis must be stronger than the arguments against the hypothesis on the basis of experience. Solutions to problems are not absolutely certain, but only plausible. This amounts to saying that theory building is carried out by the analytic method. The analytic method is the method according to which to solve a problem one looks for some hypothesis that is a sufficient condition for solving the problem. That is, such that the solution to the problem can be deduced from it. The hypothesis is obtained from the problem and possibly other data or available by some non-deductive rule and must be plausible. But the hypothesis in its term is a problem, must be solved, and is solved in the same way. That is, one looks for another hypothesis that is a sufficient condition for solving the problem posed by previous hypothesis. It is obtained from the latter and possibly other data already available by some non-deductive rule and must be plausible and so and infinitum. Being carried out by the analytic method, theory building does not come to an end. It is an ongo ongoing process. Hypotheses are subject to be modified or placed when they become implausible as new data emerge. The modified or new hypotheses are obtained through an analysis of the reasons why the former hypotheses have become implausible. The analytic view of theories is supported by Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. For according to it, no system of hypotheses can solve all the problems of a given field. The hypotheses are bound to be replaced sooner or later with other, more general ones through a potentially infinite process, since every system of hypotheses is incomplete by nature and needs to appeal to other systems to bridge its gaps. Moreover, the analytic view of theories is able to provide the rational account of theory building in terms of hypotheses obtained by non-deductive rules and validated by their plausibility. Furthermore, the analytic view of theories is able to account for theory change because it establishes a rational connection between subsequent theories. On the basis of it, the hypothesis of the new theory can be formulated through an analysis of the reasons why the hypothesis of the preceding theory has become implausible. I will give you now some examples of story, some historical examples of theories which have been uh, built up with this method. An example of theory building in accordance with the analytic view is Kepler's theory of the motion of planets. The problem 
Kepler wanted to solve by theory was to explain what is the moving power of the planets, how this moving power acts on them, and why the planets farther away from the Sun move slower than those closer to the Sun. Kepler's theory was based on the hypothesis that the moving power of the planets is the Sun, that the Sun moving power acts at a distance and that it impels each planet more strongly in proportion to how near it is to the Sun. Kepler arrived at his hypothesis through an analogy between the light emanating from the Sun that illuminates the planets and the power emanating from the Sun that causes the planets to move. The analogy was motivated by the fact that the light that illuminates the planets emanates from the sun and acts at a distance and gets weaker with distance. From this, by analogy, Kepler inferred that the power that causes the planets to move emanates from the sun, it acts at a distance and gets weaker with distance. Indeed, and now I quote Kepler, Kepler states, let us suppose that motion is dispensed by the sun in the same proportion as light. Then, as sun's light acts at a distance, since it does not exist in the intermediate space between the source and the illuminable, this is equally true of the motive power. And as sun's light also grows thinner with distance from the sun, similarly, this moving cause grows weaker with distance. Thus, Kepler arrived at the hypothesis upon which his theory was based through an inference by analogy. Another example of theory building in accordance with the analytic view is Newton's theory of universal gravitation. The problem Newton wanted to solve by theory was to explain the structure of the system of the world. Newton's theory was based on the hypothesis that gravity exists in all bodies universally and the gravitation toward each of the particles of a body is inversely as the score as the distance of places from those particles. Newton arrived at this hypothesis through an induction from the fact that gravity exists in all planets and the gravity toward any one planet is inversely as the square as the distance of places from the center of the planet. From this, by induction, Newton inferred that gravity exists in all bodies universally and the gravitation toward each of the particles of a body is inversely at the square at the distance of places from those particles. Indeed, Newton states, I quote, we have already proved that all planets gravitate toward one another and also that the gravity toward any one planet taken by itself is inversely at the square of the distance of places from the center of the planet. From this we may infer that gravity exists in all bodies universally and the gravitation toward each of the individual equal particles of the body is inversely at the square of the distance of places from those particles. Thus, uh, Newton arrived at the hypothesis upon which his theory was based to the inferred by induction. Another example of theory building in accordance with the analytic view is Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. The problem Darwin wanted to solve by his theory was to explain the characteristics of existing living things and how these characteristics came to be. Darwin's theory was based on two hypotheses. First, natural selection produced different species of animals and plants. And second, as more individuals of any species are produced than can possibly survive, there must be a struggle for existence. Darwin arrived at these two hypotheses through an analogy and an induction. Darwin arrived at hypothesis A, natural selection, through an analogy between artificial selection and natural selection. His starting point was that breeders used artificial selection to produce different breeds of animals and plants. From this, by analogy, Darwin inferred that nature, not breeders, but nature, 
used natural selection to produce different species of animals and plants. And Darwin arrived at the second hypothesis, struggle for existence, through an induction. The starting point was Malthus' observation that as more human beings are produced than can possibly survive, there must be a struggle for existence. From this, by induction, Darwin inferred that as more individuals of any species, not human beings, individuals of any species are produced that can be possibly survive, there must be a struggle for existence. In fact, Darwin states that I, E, E, e came to the conclusion that selection was, in was the principal change from the study of domesticated productions, namely from the artificial selection as done by domestic animals. And B, he came to, conclusion, to the conclusion that in many species, as more individuals are produced that can possibly survive, there must in every case be a struggle for existence, from the doctrine of Malthus applied with manifold force to the whole animal and vegetal kingdoms. Thus, Darwin arrived at the hypothesis upon which his theory was based through an inference by analogy and an inference by induction. Another example of theory building in accordance with the analytic view is Bohr's theory of the structure of the atom, the problem Bohr wanted to solve by his theory was indeed to explain the structure of the atom. Bohr's theory was based on the hypothesis that atoms consist of a nucleus surrounded by cluster of electrons which rotate around the nucleus in fixed phantasm orbits. Bohr arrived at this hypothesis through a metaphor. The atom behaves as if it were a minuscule quantized solar system. Thus, some properties of a quantized solar system can be transferred to the atom. Indeed, an inference by metaphor is one by which a thing of a certain kind, called the primary subject, behaves as if it were a thing of another kind, called the secondary subject. In both cases, the primary subject was the atom and the secondary subject was a quantized solar system. While analogy expresses similarity, metaphor does not express similarity, it creates similarity. Indeed, Bohr states that the atom behaves as if it were a minuscule quantized solar system consisting of a positively charged nucleus surrounded by a cluster of electrons. The states of the electron system, Bohr's rights, can be pictured as planetary motions obeying Keplerian laws. Specifically, the electrons are arranged at equal angular intervals in coaxial rings rotating around the nucleus, and the angular momentum of every electron around the center of its orbit is equal to the universal value of H. Thus, Bohr arrived at the hypothesis upon which his theory was based to an inference by metaphor. In the process of theory building, according to an analytic view, non-dedactive rules play an essential role because hypotheses are introduced to them. This depends on the fact that non-dedactive rules can produce new knowledge, while deductive rules cannot produce new knowledge. This claim may seem problematic since several people maintain and maintain and maintain that the data rules can produce new knowledge. For example, Pravis states that in mathematics one solves problems by the data proofs from phrases held to be true. Thus, while St. Taylor inferred Fermat's last theorem deductively from initial premises that were agreed by mathematicians to express known truths. Generally, uh, Travis claims, all mathematical knowledge is obtained by <coughs> deduction from truths already known. This, however, conflicts with the fact that, for example, when Cantor demonstrated that for any cardinal number there is a greater cardinal number, he did not deduce this from truths already known, since it was impossible to demonstrate it within the bounds of traditional mathematics. Demonstrating it required formulating a new concept and a new theory of the infinite. Therefore, 
No full mathematical demonstrations are deductions from truths already known. It could be objected that since the use of deductive rules requires labor, deductive rules can produce new knowledge. This is what Frege claims. He states that although the conclusion of a deduction is in a way contained covertly in the whole set of premises taken together, this does not absolve us from the labor of actually extracting them and settling them out in their own right. Therefore, the conclusions we drew from the premises can extend our knowledge. The conclusion, Frege states, are contained in the premise, but as plants are contained in their seeds, not as beams are contained in a house. This argument, however, is invalid because there is an algorithm, algorithm method for enumerating all deductions from a given premises, and hence for enumerating all conclusions which can be deduced from a given premises. Then, as Turing states, we can imagine that all proofs take the form of a search to this enumeration for the theorem for which the proof is decided. Although Turing goes on, in practice, we don't really want to make proofs by hunting through enumeration for them, since this is a very long method, nevertheless, the usual procedure for finding a proof is always theoretically though not practically, replaceable by the longer method. So, ingenuity is replaced by patience. Given enough time and space, the algorithm method will enumerate all proofs, and if a conclusion can be proved, the algorithm method will sooner or later find a proof of it. So, contrary to Frege's claim, extracting conclusions from given premises is a purely mechanical task. It can be performed by computer and it requires no labor. Moreover, saying that conclusions are contained in the premises as plants are contained in their seeds is misleading. For plants can develop from seeds only by absorbing water from the soil and harvesting energy from the sun. So, only using something which is not contained in the seeds. On the contrary, Conclusions can be deduced from premises without using anything not contained in the premises, as the quotation from Aristotle given by Lorenzo this morning <laughs> says. In relation to Frege's argument, a distinction must be made between objective novelty and psychological novelty. The conclusions of deduction may be psychologically surprising and hence may have psychological novelty because we are incapable of making even comparatively short deductions without the help of processes external to us. But this does not mean that conclusions of deductions extend our knowledge and hence have objective novelty. Frege's claim that they extend our knowledge is a form of psychology. For Frege mistakes psychological novelty from objective novelty. In the process of theory building, according to the analytic method, the concept of plausibility plays a central role in the validation of theories. Indeed, the hypothesis on which a theory is based can be accepted only if they are plausible. But a hypothesis is said to be plausible if the arguments for the hypothesis are stronger than the arguments against it on the basis of experience. Solutions to problems are not certain, but only plausible. This depends on the fact that the process of theory building, according to the NTV, is based on heuristic reasoning. And heuristic reasoning cannot guarantee certainty. On the other hand, heuristic reasoning is essential in theory building, because only heuristic reasoning can produce novelty. As Polya states, if you take a heuristic conclusion as certain, you may be fooled and disappointed. But if you neglect heuristic conclusion altogether, you will make no progress at all. That solutions to problems are not certain, but only plausible, does not mean that plausible can be identified with probable. Rather, plausible can be identified with Aristotle's endoxus. Indeed, Aristotle states that in order to determine whether a hypothesis endoxus, we must examine the arguments for it 
and the arguments against it. The mistake of identifying plausible with probable goes back to Boethius, who translated Aristotle and Aristotle as probable. This was mentioned this morning. The mistake, however, has been simply uh, repeated many times since then. For instance, Polyas himself says that one can use the calculus of probability to render more precise our views on plausible reasoning. For the calculus of probabilities obeys the same rules as the calculus of probabilities. But it's not so. Plausibility involves a comparison between the arguments for the hypothesis and the arguments against it. So it's not a mathematical concept. Commercially, probability is a mathematical concept. This was made quite clear from Kant, who states that on the one hand, plausibility is concerned with whether, in the cognition, there are more grounds for the thing than against it. On the other hand, there is a mathematics of probability. In fact, there are hypotheses which are plausible, but in terms of the classical concept of probability, have zero probability. On the other hand, there are hypotheses which are not plausible, but again in terms of the classical concept of probability, have non-zero probability. The same holds on other concepts of probability. A hypothesis which is plausible at one stage may become implausible at a later stage, because new data can always emerge which change the balance between the arguments for the hypothesis and the arguments against it. For example, the hypothesis on which Bohr's theory of the structure of the atom was based, the atom consists of a nucleus surrounded by clusters of electrons which rotate around the nucleus and a fixed and fantastic orbit, was plausible when Bohr first stated it, but became implausible later on. For example, when new data showed that he could not explain the spectral lines of atoms with more than one electron. The crucial step in theory building in accordance with the analytic view is the discovery of solutions to problems. The question how solutions to problems are discovered often receives incongruous answers, such as Polly's answer, who states, the first rule of discovery is to have brains and good luck. The second rule of discovery is to sit tight and wait until you get the right idea. This answer is incongruous because it is of the same kind as that of Moliere's bachelier's. I'm asked by a learned doctor for the cause and reason why opium makes one sleep, to which I reply, because there is in it a dormitive virtue whose nature is to make the senses closing. Polyas answer amounts to saying that the cause and reason why the mind discovers solutions to problems is that there is a, a discovered virtue in it whose nature is to make the, man, the mind inventive. Polya's answer is all the more incongruous because Polya admits that there are methods of discovery. Indeed, he states that there are procedures which are typically useful in solving problems and are practices by every sane person sufficient interest in his problems. And Polya goes on, the best of such procedures is the method of analysis or method of working backwards. In fact, a reasonable answer to the question how can solutions to problems be discovered is that they can be discovered by the analytic method. The latter has been recognized from antiquity as the main method for problem solving. Since the crucial step in theory building in accordance with the analytic method is discovery of solutions to problems, theory building is a variety of problem solving and specifically problem solving by the analytic method. The view that the theory building is a problem solving by analytic method is apparently related to Lodan's view that science is essentially a problem solving activity. Lodan states that we don't have any way of knowing for sure that science is true or that it is getting closer to the truth. Therefore, according to Lodan, we cannot say that the aim of science is truth or our approximation to truth. Such aims are utopian 
in the literal sense that we can never know whether they are being achieved. <coughs> Rather, Golden goes on, science fundamentally aims at the solution of problems. While a criterion of truth will never be found, we can determine whether a given theory does or does not solve a particular problem. So far, so good. However, after stating that science fundamentally aims at a solution of problem, Lodan also states that the case has yet to be made that the rules governing the techniques whereby theories are invented, if such rules there be, are the sort of things that philosophers should claim any interest in. Discovery, according to Logan, cannot be a concern of philosophy because a theory is an artifact. Uh, the investigation of the model of manufacture of artifacts is not normally viewed as a philosophical activity, and quite flatly so, because the techniques appropriate to just investigation are those of the empirical sciences, such as psychology. So Lodan ends up accepting Frege's view. According to Frege, philosophy cannot be concerned with the way in which new results are discovered. The question of discovery is a merely subjective psychological one, because it may have to be answered differently for different persons. Like Frege, Lodan claims that discovery is a matter that can be a subject only for empirical sciences, such as psychology. This view is unjustified because, of, as already mentioned, from the antiquity a method of discovery is known and has been recognized as the main method for problem solving, that is, the analytical method, in, we, in which there is nothing subjective or psychological. What is the purpose of theory solving? The purpose is twofold. First, to solve problems by finding hypotheses which are the key to the discovery of solutions. And second, to justify solutions by showing that they follow from hypotheses which are plausible. Both purposes are essential to knowledge. The first purpose is essential to the extension of knowledge. The second is essential to the validation of knowledge. Neither purpose, however, can be achieved with certainty, for non-deductive rules don't absolutely guarantee to produce hypotheses which are the key to the scope of solutions. And even when they produce new hypotheses, they don't absolutely guarantee to justify the solutions, since the latter will only be plausible, thus not absolutely certain. On the other hand, this is no limitation, because there is no source of knowledge capable of guaranteeing truth or certainty. Possible knowledge is the best we can achieve in all fields, including mathematics. As Plato states, certain knowledge is either impossible or extremely difficult to come by in this life. We can only adopt the best and less refutable of human hypotheses and embark on it as upon a raft, plan the risk of saving the sea or life. that would allow us to deduce complete knowledge. And then you mentioned the case of bias theory. That's very interesting because there you have really an easy statement that determines in arithmetic and to prove it, you have to make a major tool, inventing incredible structure, it, the variations of Grothendieck Stopoi. I mean, amazing. Now, this is a bias zero statement. It's most likely to be formally provable, but it's very hard to prove it because then you have to. The only way we know is to deduce within arithmetic the consistency of arithmetic. It's very incredibly hard. But as an example, where a very simple formal statement requires invention of structure, which is, as I said before, it Euclid invented the first fundamental structure. There is nothing to do with it's a complement to the axiomatic method, line with no thickness. But again, it's this monomania of the finite strings of symbols. 
and how to get out of it. And I, I don't know, the, yeah, the real problem there. I, I think there is. Uh, uh, I wanted to read the, the few lines in reference to the yeah. previous talk, because uh, it's a paper of last February on Nature Biotechnology concerning uh, the so-called genetic disease. And I'm very pleased that our colleagues in analytic philosophy now concentrate on the molecular biology of the about 15 or 20 genetic diseases that indeed are related to, to the young. We know that very well. And they let, they, they let alone the other problems of humanity, because those diseases are very, are very, very rare. Mm -hmm. But even in that case, in that paper last February, uh, in, uh, in, the, in Nature Biotechnology, this data, a comprehensive screen of 874 genes in 589,000 uh, genomes led to the case that 13 adults, 13% 13 of adults suffering mutations of eight severe Mendelian conditions with no reported clinical manifestation of the indicator disease. So even in those very few, very few cases where we only want us to refer to genome, even there, this is not enough because there is no direct connection between a gene which is not well defined, there is no good definition of gene and the phenotypes. And it's exactly the same frame of mind you have. We need a variety of approaches to knowledge that integrate each other. There is no way to speak on the monomania of finite alphabetic stream, as Krakow was saying. Unfortunately, those streams are written in an alphabet, not in the ideograms. We, we are closed in, in, in alphabetic culture that really forced no, no, no. Yeah, This is a question. What is the question? Just get in some information. <laughs> now, the question did you read the theorems concerning the, the, the types? I mean, you know, the, those considerations falsify my, my, my mathematics because you can show that you have randomness popping up in large numbers. That you cannot control. Yeah, I agree, so that's, that's all. <laughs> Thank you for the information. <laughs> okay, Emiliano, I think you were next. David. David. Oh, David. 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 You were next. You Emiliano first. was next. No. Emiliano was next. Then. Okay, so, so thank you, Carlo, for your talk, and also I would thank you for all your efforts put forward in the last two decades uh, uh, in order to explore this subject. Uh, I have two brief questions. The first one is about the process validation. And I would, would, like, would like to ask you if this process can be pursued and eventually reached also by heuristic reasoning, so without uh, drawing conclusion. And maybe I could, you could tell, tell us more about um, the role, if any, of deduct, deduction in, in your picture, or deductive reasoning in your picture. Mm -hmm. what's, it, what's the role and... and what do you mean? The, the what is the role? Yeah, the oh, role yes, of the, the, yes, the, the. So the, these two brief oh, questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, about the role, I, 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 as I said, perhaps it was a very good point. Anyway, about the role, the Indian analytic method, I mean, both induction or uh, other non deductive methods are used and deduction. Because by non deductive rules, you discover hypothesis, but then you have to prove that the hypothesis is sufficient to solve the problem. That's the deduction. Okay? Yeah. The deduction gives nothing new, just confirms that the hypothesis is sufficient, right? Discovery is bottom up by non deductive rules, right? So there is a role, important, yeah. but it's only for validating, I mean, to find out whether the conclusion follows from the hypothesis that's discovered, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and the first question was about validation. It, yes. If validation yes. can be yes. achieved so by. Let, let me say something. I mean, what I said was that you, in science, do, you don't have truth. You have flexibility, right? Because all theories of which have been, like scientific realism or liberalized scientific realism, they have assumed that the goal of science is truth. But then you have to prove this problem that a theory is truth in what sense? Correspondence theory? Okay. If a theory is true in, in, in the sense of the correspondence theory, then you are assuming that the theory corresponds to facts. Then, if it corresponds, it cannot become false. Yeah. Either corresponds or it doesn't correspond. So, scientific realism cannot explain why, as a matter of fact, in the history of science, all theories become more, uh, sooner or later false, are considered false, right? So, there is this problem. And the same problem is with pattern position. No, no time now to explain, but anyway, there is, 
every theory of science, which is the goal of science, the, the, is true, is completely, uh, it doesn't explain clearly anything. So you have to replace truth with possibility. Why? Because truth is not absolute concept. Possibility is a relative concept. A theory which is plausible now can become implausible later on because possibility is a balance between arguments for and uh, against. And this balance can change all the time, right? So there is no uh, contradiction with the fact that the theory which is plausible at a certain time becomes implausible later on, and vice versa, of course. So that, that's why uh, I'm saying that validation is uh, showing that the uh, hypothesis is plausible by comparing, balancing arguments. And what this was the endoxa. Yeah. Aristotle theory of endoxa. So nothing new. That's Aristotle simple. <laughs> Living in you. Yeah. <laughs> Except that Aristotle thought that science is about truths. Okay, this is not matter. <laughs> yeah. Can I interpose a remark though? I think it's a little unfair to explain the development of the entire Bayesian school. I say it was all because Boethius mistranslated Aristotle. I mean, I think <laughs> there's a bit more to it than that, actually. Uh, anyway, that's just a remark. Sorry, they may go to the next one. Um, so, if, if you'll indulge, I wanted to describe a practice that I see a lot of, because I'm not quite sure how to see to put it in this framework. And that practice is I've got some data sets. And I specify a possibly enormous space of possibilities, mm -hmm. possible hypotheses. I mean, you know, far more than there are atoms in the, in the universe. And then I allow a machine to, in some fairly directed way, perhaps entirely deterministic, there's no intuition in about it, search that space to find a set of possibilities that the data don't rule out. So does, is, is that the, when I specify that enormous space, I feel like I'm not, that's not an inductive loop. So am I offloading the induction to the machine? But or so, I'm just trying to understand how to think about it. Yes, but how does the machine make this work? I mean, as some algorithm which has been built up according to some theory, right? Right. So, well, but the theory of the algorithm is not the same as the, so the search algorithm yeah. is based on a theory, but that theory need not be a substantive theory of the thing that the data are about. Yes, but the relevant data, what we consider relevant, mm -hmm. depends on the algorithm. Yes. And, and the algorithm has been built up according to a theory. Oh, no. so I'm not defending the big, the, 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 the crazy people saying yeah. that big data means no theory. <laughs> I, I, I agree I with you. That's insane. I I'm trying to think about how, what, what, I mean, what I do with some big data, which is absolutely, yes, I'm using theory all over the place. But it also isn't that I look at the data, I come up with a hypothesis, then I test it. It's yeah. rather I say, here's this enormous space of possibilities, and I'm going to let the machine do the testing for me because I can't sort of, yes, I can't survey all. Yes, but this way, so you, you reduce the space. I mean, yes, yes. This is the function of, the, of this, this method. I mean, okay. The function is reducing the space. I mean, it's not deterministic, of course, right. but you reduce the space, the search space. So that's an improvement. Yeah. <laughs> so you can okay. use it. But science is like that. I mean, you yeah, reduce. Yeah, yeah. No, okay. yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't clear when you said okay. the inductive okay. step how much now of that is creative okay. intuition that can't, you know. Uh, okay, we agree. Okay, yeah. perfect. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to add that, that in the case of, in the computational case, you can choose one of the ways that are used yeah. in computer science yeah, and yeah. artificial intelligence to start from data and arrive to hypotheses. Yeah. For instance, just to make a few examples, uh, probabilistic networks, mm -hmm. uh, logic programming, uh, the ancient uh, production rules, that they are able to substantiate a, a, a kind of heuristics that mm -hmm. Every, an adaptive effect, and then you reduce the. Yeah. It depends on the context, yeah. the, the 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 tool that you can use, and, and so on. Of course, a computational yes, the way of uses, representing. The yeah. functional use is to reduce the space. The and they are always algorithms. Of course, yes, but yes. express yeah, yeah. A, a kind of a discovery process or yeah. a diagnostic process. Yeah. You can have an algorithm also for induction analogy. But that, that doesn't mean the conclusion is Absolutely. certain. Right. <laughs> there was a, a, yeah. a book uh, 10 years ago, Abduction and yeah. Induction, that was all about the use of logic programming yeah. to make induction exactly. and abductions yeah. in artificial intelligence. Yeah. Yeah.
Uh, can I, I think there's time for one more question, so I think I'll ask it if I'm allowed. <laughs> um, can, I was just wondering how you would fit serendipity into your scheme. I think you could, but you might have to complicate it. Because Lekatosh says, actually, in proofs and refutations, he says, uh, we know it's very common that you end up by solving a problem different from the one you set out to solve. And he puts in brackets Columbus. Uh, so I think that's pretty true with serendipity. You, you, you start trying to solve one problem, and then you end up by solving another. And in fact, the, the little mind example, Sheskin, his problem was how can we get a sleeping pill to make yeah. this wretched patient sleep? And then he, he, he solved the problem of curing the boils. So now I'm wondering, it seems to me that you could introduce this into your scheme, but it might require a little bit of complication at some point. Anyway, what, what do you yeah. think about that? Uh, I didn't say anything about the generational problems. Most problems are generated by other problems, of course. Yeah, or by hypothesis to each other problems. Yes. Yeah. Like in this case, which, I mean, the problem arises from a hypothesis which works for solving a certain yeah. kind of problem yeah. and seems to be useful for solving another problem. But the hypothesis gave you the idea that you could sue, solve this other problem, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's part of this problem. It's not difficult. I mean, it's completely compatible with these problems. Yes, no, I'm not saying is it, uh, but I'm just wondering whether you need to introduce a little bit of complication yes. that you start trying to solve a problem, yeah. and then you suddenly switch the problem you want to solve oh. halfway through. Uh, yeah. Whether that could, whether you do that. You try to solve a problem, yeah. you make a hypothesis yeah. to try to solve this problem, you discover the hypothesis is unable to solve this problem. But then you discover that the hypothesis has some other properties. And by chance, it's able to generate or solve this problem. problem. But the hypothesis will help you to solve this other problem. Oh, yes, so, definitely. Yes. Right, so. <laughs> anyway, well, uh, we kept wonderfully to time. So, congratulations to everyone. <laughs> <laughs>